Okay, so yeah, engines actually, engine repair uh, was uh, one of the first classes that I ever taught as an instructor. In fact, my very first semester of teaching, many years ago, I taught two courses, uh, one for Sierra College and the other one for Consumers River College. And uh, for Sierra College, I taught uh, a vehicle, uh, it was engine analyzing AT61. And for CRC, I, I taught their engine repair course. So I'm a I'm an engines guy going um, going way back, and uh, even though I I do uh, like and appreciate our electric vehicles and and all that stuff, boy, there's nothing like um, building an engine yourself and hearing that thing fire up and run for the first time. It's it's just you know it's like scary and magic all at the same time. It's uh, it's awesome. So. Um, Tonight, what we're going to do is we're going to be looking at engines. Now, before we get into engines, uh, I always like to review where are we where are we at in our course. So, um, from here, I'm going to put it on my student view mode, if you will. And um, we had all kinds of crazy announcements last week. We had some issues with Zoom. I'm looking over here in my to do uh, column here. Um, but what I like to do to kind of keep up to speed with what's going on is go over to the calendar. So I'm going to click that calendar tab over there on the side. And you can see that we are right here. We're in this final week of March. Um, and essentially your assignment for this week is to do the midterm. Now, last week's class is where we did our review for the midterm exam. That's kind of weird. I don't know why that didn't link me right over to it. Midterm exam. Try that again. Okay, there we go. I must have clicked the wrong thing. Um, here we go. 25 questions. Pretty straightforward. Um, all stuff that we've talked about, ASE style, remember to separate out those technician A and B questions into tr two true false statements and put them together. Um, and I hope you guys uh, go through that test without any problems. I think if you use uh, the stuff we've been talking about in lecture, go over our uh, uh, Zoom sessions, go over the videos, look over all the information that's in these modules uh, you will be dialed in and looking A-OK -okay for, um, for the midterm, okay? Now, let me go back to the course calendar for a bit. So here we are. Again, we are in the last week of March. I'm going to skip forward to April, and uh-oh, uh I have to move some stuff around here, okay? And the reason I need to move some stuff around here is because next week for the college is spring break. In fact, what I'm going to do is we're going to go to our ARC home page and we will look at the little dog that's on the screen. No, we will look at the uh, college calendar, um, which should be, there's events, ARC events. I don't know about this website. Sometimes it drives me uh, nuts. You would think we'd have a count. I'm just going to search it out. Hmm. Spelled wrong. Hang on. No, E R C A L. There we go. Spring calendar. All right. Um, so we are going to go full term and event action, final exams. Well, I love, I love how they don't actually put, okay, here we go. March 29th through April 4th. That is our spring re recess. I don't know why that was so hard to find, but that's, uh, that's how me and the 
American River College website seem to roll sometimes, um, you know. So I'm going to move some course dates around because I don't want you guys to have to work on a bunch of new stuff during spring break. What I would love to see you do, some of you guys have had some problems. Maybe you haven't submitted your stuff. Maybe you have old stuff to work on. Let's get that stuff turned in, okay? So we're going to move some stuff around here so that when we get into April, we're going to move stuff back so you don't end up with all the stuff that's due on April 2nd. We're going to push stuff back to April 9th so you guys get that spring break and you can go have fun and unplug from your computers, hopefully. Um, but I will say this, if you're behind, if you haven't done assignments, remember, you will lose some points getting something done late but you still get a lot more points than if you don't do anything. So, so if you have work you haven't done, hey, get that work done. Get it, get it turned in and submitted, okay? Um, so we're going to be talking about engines and stuff tonight, but, but none of this stuff. In fact, I'll get my annotation tools out here. None of these things are going to be due next week. We're going to push stuff off and have stuff due on the 9th, okay? And it's gonna take me realistically a couple of weeks to talk about engines and engine maintenance and that type of thing. Um, so those will be our, our focus will be on, on how an engine operates, engine maintenance, things like changing your oil, other, other things related to that uh, is what we're gonna be focusing on, uh, you know, for this week and then moving past in, in the first couple of weeks here at April. Uh, as we kind of round things out. Okay, so just wanted you to know like where we're at, where we're going. I meant to move that stuff actually earlier today and I got caught up doing grades of all things for one of our for one of my other sections. So anyways, we will get that stuff switched around. So what you guys do need to focus on this week, everybody, is focus on, I will circle this in blue, getting that midterm exam done. Remember we... Um, did some good review for that last week. So if you were not here with us last week, review the, the video from last week and you'll be all dialed in. Um, remember, it's, it's, it's open notes, it's open internet. So you can look up those resources uh, and, and always choose the most correct answer for each question, okay? So that's what you wanna be working on this week is getting that midterm exam done, okay? Next week, no class, focus on, uh, if you haven't turned something in, get all the work that you haven't turned in done. Uh, I'm also uh, working on just a few kind of fun things uh, for you guys as a group and some extra credit stuff that I'll be uh, most likely posting uh, during our week of uh, spring break as I, as I get a chance to get a little caught up. All right, um, so with that, we'll clear out my scribbles here and what we're going to do guys is now uh dive into engines and um uh engine uh you know engine operations so i'm going to click back our course we'll go into the module right now uh there's some things that i really do want to add to this module right now it's a little bit bare bones um but i wanted to make sure it was open so that you could at least see what's going to be on the first part. Oh, April 3rd. Mm. Well, that wasn't how it's supposed to work. Let's fix that. We will leave that. So uh, with this module, we have uh, Mr. Carlton. He's one of our adjunct professors, uh, master tech from Toyota for a bunch of years. Um, just really great guy. So he, he, uh, he put together a an engine fundamentals video and presentation. We also have a whole bunch of great different um, animations and stuff here for you guys to look at. And there's a lot of them because there's four stroke cycle engines, uh, two stroke cycle engines, diesel engines. There's all kinds of stuff, um, including uh, rotary engines. So it's really we're trying to get through like, how does an engine work, right? Learning the, the basic parts and pieces um, that's what we have here. And then um, when you guys come back from break, one of the 
worksheets we'll be looking at is just some engine maintenance service stuff, which basically just gets you looking, looking up the different services and stuff. Okay. Um, so I'm going to be adding to this engine section because yeah, it's, it's a little thin. It's a little, it's a little weak and that doesn't do our engines any justice. So, so uh, watch out for that. I'm going to add some stuff like I made some videos on uh, how to read spark plugs and, and all kinds of things. I'll be adding those under that, that week nine uh, information. And then, um, and also to week 10 as we move on to more engine, engine maintenance service type of stuff. Okay. Now, if you're, if, if, if you already know that you like engines, one of the classes that you might want to think about uh, signing up for when it is open would be AT314, which is our engine repair class. Now, um, engine repair in that class, you basically uh, do some diagnostics on, on an engine and then you you take apart an engine and put it all back together and get it running again at the end of the semester. And so it's it's a pretty exciting class. It's a little bit of a stressful class though, because it's, you know, we, uh, we're, we're tearing apart a V8 engine. I mean, there's a lot of parts and pieces that are all, you know, out of that engine all over the place and to get all eight cylinders back together and running again uh, is daunting for some students. And um, so, it's one of those ones where it's um, you're you're working on a lot of stuff. There's a lot of stuff to absorb. So, um, great class. The the more you can do before you enter a class like that, the the more preparation work you can do, the better you will be prepared for it. I find a lot of the students they do a lot better in 314 if they first taken our small engine course um, first. And anything that you do working on engines, of course, on your own or in this class, like any of that stuff is going to help you guys prepare uh, for that 314 class. Because like I said, it's it's uh, we use every hour of shop time we have in that class. And what I foresee with this 314 class in the fall, I think is what I'm going to have to do, because I'm, I'm sure we'll still be in a mode where we're trying to follow uh, COVID protocols is we're probably going to take uh, this engine that is a, um, a V8 type engine, meaning that the cylinders are arranged in a V configuration. So it's, it's shaped like this. And on one side of the engine, it has four cylinders. I'm drawn by these circles here. And on the other side, it's got another four I'm not very good at drawing is three dimensionally with my computer mouse, but you get the idea. I will likely split the engine up into two halves and have one student work on one half of that V8 and have the other student work on the other half of the V8. So I'm still kind of piecing together exactly how I'm going to make it work, but it's definitely going to be a big task uh, for those students who are, who are jumping into that thing. So the more preparation you can do, the better you will you will do in the course and I think the more you'll get out of it right so and that that just holds true with everything you know um, you know even uh, this week weekend I was getting to do a little bit of racing uh, you know my preparation work consisted of spending time on the sim, uh, simulator doing uh, 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 you know watching track videos just just all kinds of stuff um, to make sure that I was fully ready to, to, you know, hit that track at full speed because I didn't have a lot of time to get up to speed um, out there. So anyways, um, so what we have up on the screen right now, guys, is uh, some of the animations that are available in CDX. Now remember CDX is something that you don't have to have for this course. Um, but it's definitely adds to it. If you do jump into the other courses like the engine repair course, you are going to want to have, you're going to need to have that CDX um, uh, program, if you will. Um, you're going to, you're going to need to have that to, um, to, to participate in that class. So I have some of that stuff open 
and I'm going to bounce back and forth between that um, presentation and our AT100 engines presentation, which I accidentally just kind of closed out and I need to get him open back up again. But before I do, I'm going to get this thing going. Um, you know, there's lots of different ways. There we go. There's lots of different ways to classify engines, guys. Um, this is kind of a cool animation. And I'm going to get it fired up here as I'm kind of moving some stuff around. Um, there's lots of different ways to, to classify engines. And, uh, you know, all of our engines and cars these days, we refer to them as internal combustion engines. And, uh, you know, what, what that leads us to, though, is, well, what, what the heck is an example of an external combustion engine? Well, um, a steam engine like you'd have in an old uh, train, that would be an example of a steam engine where we had our combustion happening on the outside and it was boiling some water, turning it into steam, right? So as I increase the RPM here, the fire gets a little higher and we pick up RPM from off of the steam. Um, and that double acting piston on the side, I mean, kind of neat, um, you know, if you're a, if you're a movie buff, maybe, you, you know, like Back to the Future 3 is kind of a kind of a classic probably by your guys' standards these days, right? It's an old movie for, for a lot of you uh, probably. And, uh, you know, they, they have a steam engine in there. So uh, that's kind of a fun one. But that was a great example of an external combustion engine. Let's see, where did my engines... presentation go. It seems like it's, hang on one second. I'm just trying to, and I have all kinds of engine presentations. Oh, okay. Here we go. Here, we, uh, engine. And cooling. So many different engine presentations now. I'm having a hard time looking for the one, one that I wanted. But anyways, all right, this one will work. So internal combustion versus external combustion. I'm going to change my screen share. And we are going to go to our presentation here. So another way to classify an engine is by how many cycles does that engine go through? So it could be a two cycle engine or it could be a four cycle or four stroke cycle engine, okay? And so with the four stroke cycle engine, it, the crankshaft itself, this piece in the center that's spinning around, has to complete two revolutions to go through those four cycles. And that in that whole chain of events, it gets one power stroke there that actually would move, move the vehicle forward, if you will. Okay. So the four stroke cycle engine, yet yeah, there's there's some dead time there, right? But it's a very efficient engine because each phase of its operation has its own separate stroke uh, in, the, in, in the cycle, if you will, okay? Conversely, a two-stroke cycle engine is a, is a multitasker. He's doing multiple things at the same time, and that means he's more powerful related to the size of the engine, but it also doesn't run as cleanly, and it doesn't get as good of... Um, uh, emissions. It makes more, more emissions, more smog. Okay. So let's go back to that four stroke cycle one um, and kind of pick it apart. And rather than just be limit ourselves to these few pictures and the animations on the, on the screens, um, what we're going to do is bounce back and forth between this thing. 
and some of the great stuff that we have here on CDX and some of the parts that I have um, in front of me. So I'm going to close out that one for the steam engine. We'll go ahead and get rid of the ARC uh, campus and stuff. And we're going to go to a uh, four stroke cycle engine. Now it says auto cycle engine. Why does it say that? Well, a guy by the name of Nicholas Otto was uh, the inventor of the, the way this engine operates, of this, of this cycle, this process, this four-stroke cycle. So it goes on intake, compression, power, and then it goes on exhaust. And it does that over and over and over again. So we're going to start the cycle and, and we, we do have to talk about some parts here real quick. And uh, to do that, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to grab some images that are loaded for me here on uh, CDX and they have all kinds of stuff. You know, don't let me forget that by the end of the night, I do want to talk about this horsepower versus torque because we can't talk about engines without talking about that. Um, but uh, what I want to get to here is um, some uh, uh, basic uh, basic parts and, uh, and pieces here, okay? So we'll go with this one. Now, you know, like the main part of the engine, right? is going to be what we call our cylinder block, okay? And it says right here, it says block, there's your block. Your cylinder block is the main metal structure of the engine, everything bolts to it. And inside, it's, inside the block, we're gonna have a series of cylinder bores or precisionly machined, both bored and then honed to a precise size, holes that pistons, like this one in my hand, are going to go up and down it, okay? And we're going to have the combustion happen on the inside of the engine, right? In, you know, up uh, towards the top of those cylinder bores. And it's through the action of the cylinder bores and the pistons and ultimately this uh, crankshaft right down here. So you see it says crankshaft right there that spins around uh, that is how we're going to get power out of this thing. It's the, the spinning crankshaft that ends up going through that, that rotational energy will go through our transmission and ultimately end up uh, what's, what's spinning our wheels and making our car go forward or our motorcycle go down the track or, or anything like that. So we have our um, engine block, another name for that. Sometimes they'll call like the bottom of the block, the crankcase. You can see that we have a crankshaft here and then the crankshaft gets put into the main bearings. And here's the main bearing caps that bolt to this whole assembly. And that's what holds the crankshaft to the bottom of the block, right? The top of the block surface is called the deck. And, you know, down here on the bottom of the block is our oil pan. So when we are, we are checking our oil, right? What happens is when you shut the engine off, the oil all goes, drains down in the block and drains to the bottom of that pan. And then you come through with your um, your dipstick here. Let's say this is our dipstick. And you poke that thing in and it goes through a tube, which actually ends up directing it to the bottom of the pan. That's how you're checking your oil level. It's you're dipping the, the dipstick into the oil into the pan, okay? So, We'll clear out these drawings. And what we'll do is pick on another uh, picture. Now what's moving up and down in those cylinder bores are our pistons. And so here we can see our cylinder walls here. I'll make these walls in green. And it shows us the piston here and the piston rings, which form a sliding seal to the cylinder wall, and they're drawn in red. 
And then this guy in yellow right here, um, I'm gonna draw an arrow up to him. Okay, and so that guy there is our connecting rod. And so the connecting rod or the con rod as uh, some hot rodders would say, the connecting rod connects the piston to the crankshaft. And it's the action of the piston, it's connecting rod and crankshaft, how we're gonna change this up and down motion of the piston, right? We see it going up, we see it going down, we see it going up again. That's how we change that up and down motion of the piston reciprocating back and forth in that cylinder bore to a round and round motion, which we're gonna then take out of the crankshaft, move through our transmission, and ultimately again is propelling us down the road, right? It's that rotary motion that's spinning our wheels. Um, that's how we how we get that thing changed from up and down or reciprocating to a to a round and round, right? Rotary motion. So now we got our engine block, right? Our cylinder bores, the deck surface or top of the block. We have our piston, piston rings, which form that sliding seal between the piston and the cylinder. Our connecting rod linking the piston to the to the uh, crankshaft, and the crankshaft is drawn here in blue, and that's going to be, be spinning around in um, in relationship. Uh, uh, with everything. So um, when we talk about two revolutions in a four stroke cycle, so I'm going to put um, over here, I'm going to write uh, four stroke cycle, two revolutions per cycle. Well, what do I mean when I write that down? Um, it means that that crankshaft that's drawn in blue spins around twice. It does 720 degrees of, of rotation, if you will. I'll write that over here. 720 degrees of rotation in one four-stroke cycle to make this thing work. Now, of that 720 degrees, we're only going to get one power stroke out of that, okay? So we got some of the major pieces there. I have a couple other pieces to get to, and then we'll get back to this concept of the cycles and the degrees and all that stuff, okay? So I'm gonna close out that image and that image. Uh, and what we're gonna do is uh, kind of keep scrolling through. And uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at um, uh, a real, you know, a real uh, uh, animated engine and then some real engines. Because if I take this picture here and I look at it, now what I can see is, okay, well, there's the engine block down here with the cylinder, piston, connecting rod, and crankshaft that we talked about. But this part up here, I'm going to uh, outline that in red here, bolts on top of the engine block, and that is the cylinder head, okay? So the head bolts on top of the block. And on, uh, you know, most all engines, unless you go to really old stuff, what we're going to do is we're going to put these valves up inside the head. Now, what do the valves do? The valves are going to let air and fuel mixture into the engine, and they're going to let the exhaust gases flow out of the engine. So they're, they're doorways, if you will, or passages that let us bring air and fuel in and then get the exhaust gas out. And remember, this is an internal combustion engine. So we are having a burn happening on the inside of this engine, right? So we got to bring in air and fuel so we can burn it. And then we got to get those leftover gases that have now been burnt. We got to get that stuff out of there so we can bring in more air and fuel again. And that is the job of the valves. In blue here, we have an intake valve. And drawn in red here, we have an exhaust valve. Okay. So the cylinder head bolts on top of the engine block. It's normally going to contain the valves. This particular one 
is an overhead camshaft engine. In fact, this one has one and two. So it's a uh, dual overhead cam engine, D-O-H-C, dual overhead cam. And back when this was kind of a new thing, they used to put a little badge on the back of the car that'd say, oh, it's D-O-H-C, dual overhead cam. Um, which is a, you know, a pretty efficient way. It makes the engine taller. You can see that this is kind of a, a tall looking engine here. Makes it taller, but it makes it breathe a lot better. One thing I want you guys to think about when you, when you think of an internal combustion engine is this guy's basically a, it's basically a pump. In fact, I'm gonna clear out these drawings. We'll close this guy out. Um, Here's what a, a real engine would look like. We've taken off the front timing cover and we can see the timing chain so we can link the crankshaft to the camshaft. Um, so that's what it would, you know, look like on a real engine, a more modern uh, design there and not something that's drawn. Um, there's that drawing. But now we're gonna put the animation together. So we have this dual overhead cam engine in this animation here and you can see the pistons going up and down and we're bringing in air fuel mixture we're burning it and then we're getting it out of there so i want you guys to think of this engine as basically it's a big um it's a big pump That engine is like an air pump. And so if I can pump more air through it, I can then in turn make more power. So I could do that by making the engine physically larger, right? Like a bigger cylinder bore with larger pistons or having the pistons move up and down further, have a longer stroke on there. That would be another way to make the engine's internal displacement larger, okay? But if I can do other things to make the engine a more efficient pump, maybe I put an intake system on here. And here is my intake on this guy. Maybe I put an intake system on here that makes it really easy for all the air to get inside the engine. Well, then the pump's not gonna have to work so hard to get the air in there. It's going to be more efficient and it's going to help me pump more air, right? Maybe I make uh, an exhaust system that flows better. And so again, it makes the pump more efficient. If I can move more air through this motor, I can make more power from this motor, right? Um, so when we get into performance of our engines, all, you know, a lot of it comes down to hey, this engine's like an air pump. And if I can either make it pump more air by just making parts larger, or if I can make stuff more efficient, then I can make the engine more powerful. And of course, what we see today is that engines are, are largely, they're, they're, they're smaller. Their, their internal displacement is smaller, meaning that they have smaller uh, cylinder bores, right? This distance here, which it just changed to red. So we'll wait for it to change to white or something. That cylinder board di uh, diameter is smaller. The stroke is smaller. And when you, when you do the calculations of that thing, this thing has less displacement. Think of this word displacement. I'm gonna type it over here to the side. Uh, displacement basically is your internal size of the engine. Now, usually an engine with more displacement will physically be larger on the outside, but not always. You have some engines that look big, but maybe their internal displacement isn't as big as you would think it would be on the outside. You guys, I'm sure have heard of some different engine displacements, okay? You might've heard of an engine that's a uh, a 350 cubic inch Chevy, 350 Chevy, mm, super popular engine, uh, was made for, you know, 50 years. They sold a, a zillion of them, you know, all kinds of cars and trucks. 
Um, maybe another engine size you heard of is you've been uh, rolling somewhere in your 5.0. Oops, 5.0 liter, right? You and Vanilla Ice, you're cruising in that 5.0. Um, that relates to the displacement, the internal size of the engine that was in his, you know, 1991 uh, Ford Mustang or whatever. Um, uh, so there's different ways that you can talk about the size of the engine or its displacement. It can be in cubic inches. It could be in liters if it's a smaller engine, right? Um, for a motorcycle or something. Oh, well, maybe maybe it's in cc. So I have a 250 cc or cubic centimeter. Uh, cubic centimeters of displacement in my engine. So that's another way you could classify the engine. You can classify it by, uh, you know, what's what's its displacement, right? How big is it? You could also just classify it by how many cylinders does it have, right? And how are the cylinders arranged? Oh, it's an inline four, or it's a V8, or it's a horizontally opposed four, like a Subaru engine. And uh, if anybody in this class is a Subaru guy, you know, guy or gal, you know that they have a kind of a distinct sound that they make. Uh, just like if um, somebody's a fan of like Harley Davidson's, they had a, they, that's a classic V twin type engine. And that engine has its own kind of sound and exhaust note uh, in the way it runs. So how many cylinders does it have? How are they arranged? <clears throat> What's the displacement? Uh, you know, where are the valves? Is it, a, is it an overhead valve engine? Is it an engine that's overhead cam? There's lots of ways to classify these engines, but the vast majority of the engines that you're going to find in your cars and trucks, and even these days for a lot of your, you know, uh, scooters and mopeds and different things, is going to be a four stroke cycle engine. Um, also, sometimes called an auto cycle engine after. Uh, after the inventor, uh, Nicholas Otto. So it all starts off. I'm going to, I'm going to clear out some of these drawings here. <clears throat> it all starts at, uh, uh, top dead center of the, oops, I'm on the wrong stroke and I'll just have to get a plan again. Uh, it's all going to start at top dead center of the intake stroke. Okay, so I need to get some nomenclature, more nomenclature down for you guys. Uh, and that is, I'm going to draw some stuff here. So when the piston is at the top of its point of travel, okay, we're going to call that T, D, C, top dead center. Okay, now you can tell the piston started at top dead center and he's starting to cruise down to the bottom. When he gets all the way to the bottom of his stroke, we're gonna call that bottom dead center or BDC, okay? So this cycle starts with the piston at top dead center on the intake stroke. And what happens here is the intake valve begins to open up and let me, I'm gonna back up the engine a little bit. So here, we're getting ready to start here. So the intake valve is just opening up. We can see the piston is at top dead center of the compression stroke. The exhaust valve is closed at this point and air is allowed to enter from outside the engine. It's gonna go through our air filter and stuff, and it's going to go into our air intake past our throttle. Now, what do we con control with our foot on the accelerator pedal, on the gas pedal, as a lot of times we call it, put your foot on the gas? Well, really, what we're largely controlling is the airflow into the engine, okay? When we move that accelerator pedal or gas pedal, what we're doing is we're moving this valve right here in the throttle. And as we mash that pedal down, this, this valve pivots and it opens up 
to be straight back and forth so I can get a lot more air into the engine. So basically we can control how much air the engine breathes in by what we're doing with the throttle pedal or gas pedal as a lot of folks would, would know it by, okay? Some folks, if you're into EVs, you might properly call it an accelerator pedal because you're not controlling gas with that at all, right? Um, so that's how we control the speed of the engine. So the, you know, you step on the throttle and some air is then going to get into the engine. The intake valve is opened up, the pistons moving down, and that creates a low pressure inside the engine, a vacuum, if you will. And that draws the air into the engine, right? That's commonly what we think about. Now, um, it is kind of a misnomer, guys, in that really what happens is, is because there's less pressure on the inside of the engine than there is pressure on the outside of the engine, it's this outside pressure that's uh, somewhere about 15 PSI at sea level. It's this higher pressure on the outside that actually forces the air from outside to want to go to the lower pressure on the inside. But you know what? It's not a big deal. If you want to think that that engine sucks in that air for where we're at in our automotive education right now, that will work okay. All right. So it goes on the intake stroke. There's a low pressure inside the engine. We draw in that, uh, that air into the engine. And what we're also going to do with that air is we got to mix some fuel with it, right? It, the air by itself isn't going to burn. So what you'll notice in this little animation right here, uh, drawn in, in green here, they have this guy right here. This is a fuel injector. He is going to spray some fuel right here. And so the engine goes on its intake stroke, draws air in the end of the engine, but it also draws some, some fuel with it. So what we end up with is drawing in an air slash fuel mixture into the engine on the intake stroke, okay? During this time, essentially the exhaust valve was closed in this part of the cycle. Now, if I keep this thing going along, what we're gonna do is the piston's gonna keep going down. It's gonna draw in that air fuel mixture. And then what we're gonna do What we're going to do here is we are going to then keep that thing coming around. We're going to close that intake valve. So at this point, I have the intake valve closed and I have the exhaust valve closed. And we're going to squeeze that air fuel mixture into a tighter and tighter and tighter spot. And as we squeeze that air fuel mixture into a tighter area, the density of the air fuel mixture gets higher and higher and higher. We also mix up that air and fuel more and more. And it starts warming up. We start, it starts adding heat, a lot of heat energy to the air fuel mixture as we squeeze it, compact it into a tighter spot. And so from there, that air fuel mixture is primed. It really wants to, you know, start burning up at this point. It just needs a little bit more heat to kick off the, the combustion process. And we're going to provide that additional heat from, you guessed it, a spark plug here. So this spark plug that's threaded in the motor like this is going to fire a little spark, okay? We're actually gonna have a spark jump the gap um, by means of our ignition system. And that's gonna provide us with that last little bit of heat energy that we need to ignite the air fuel mixture and to get it burning. Now, one thing I want you guys to realize is that this is a burn that happens super fast, but it is not an explosion in a gasoline motor. It should not be an explosion. When you have an explosion going on, it's gonna start breaking parts inside the engine, okay? So it's really a very, very, very fast burn process. And actually, if I go back on this thing, how they've drawn it was pretty cool, really, because they do a good job. I'm backing this thing up, backing it up. And so what they show is that 
first the spark does its thing and then you see this red flame going starting to spread out and he spreads out more and he spreads out more and he spreads out more and it's kind of like a grass fire that would move across a field okay it starts at the spark plug electrode and spreads out very rapidly from there and as it spreads out it makes a whole lot of heat and it makes a whole lot of pressure and it's that heat and that pressure that pushes the piston down now on the power stroke that's what pushes the piston down on the power stroke and ultimately is what's going to spin the crankshaft and make us go down the road so it's all about everything we do in the cycle the intake the compression it's all about leading up to this one power stroke okay this is the time that we're actually applying some energy to the crankshaft okay so we ignite the air fuel mixture it starts pushing the piston down on the power stroke the crankshaft starts rolling around working its way with the connecting rod to make that happen to change that up and down motion to a rotary motion right and now we're at a point where we've pretty much burned up all the air fuel mixture inside there okay it's all burned up. We're, um, you know, looking pretty good, but we're not going to bring in, not going to be able to bring in any more air fuel mixture unless we get these exhaust gases out of the engine and make way, make room for the new air fuel mixture that's entering the engine. So we have one more stroke to do, and that is the you guessed it, the exhaust stroke here. So the engine keeps coming around. And what you're gonna see happen is that the exhaust valve here opens up, okay? And on the other side of the exhaust valve, you have the exhaust port, and that's gonna bolt uh, an exhaust manifold or header up to the cylinder head. And from there, it's going to go out to our catalytic converter, if we have one of those, and to our muffler, and ultimately to our tailpipe, where the exhaust gases can then flow out, right? So the exhaust valve opens up, and the piston keeps coming around here and helps scavenge and push all these exhaust gases out until the exhaust valve then closes, and we're all primed to do this cycle all over again and bring in fresh air fuel mixture. And we do that again and again and again and again and again. Now, if you're driving down the road on the freeway and your tachometer on your dash says, okay, you're going, uh, maybe it says, hey, you're going uh, 2,000 RPM, that's revolutions per minute. What is that RPM of? That's RPM of the crankshaft. So it's spinning around in there 2000 times per minute. That's what that means. That also means that in that same minute of time where it spun around 2000 times, remember how I said it takes two revolutions of the crankshaft for a one four stroke cycle? That means I'm having 1000 four stroke cycles happen every minute. Right. So as my engine breathes in more air fuel mixture by me step, stepping on the throttle pedal, right? I open that guy up. I let more air in the, the carburetor or fuel injection system then in turn mixes more fuel with that air that's entering the engine. Well, now the speed of the engine is going to increase. So now maybe it's going at 3000 RPM. 4,000 RPM, 5,000 RPM. Um, you know, if you're really racing it, maybe you're up at six or 7,000 RPM if it goes that high. Um, you can see that, you know, as I get up to higher and higher speeds, like there's there's less time for all this stuff to, stuff to happen and the engine parts have to be built to handle the high stress of forces that happen as we go up to higher and higher and higher RPM. So it is, you know, a lot harder on your engine to be running at high levels of speed because all those parts got to be whirring around in there uh, that much faster. And the, the stresses go up dramatically. It's not like a linear deal. It's one of these things where it's very progressive um, and really increases a lot 
as you climb the RPM scales. So, um, but that's what's going on in there. That's a four stroke cycle engine. Um, I only had the one power stroke for the whole ball of wax there, right? But every phase of the engine, right? Had its own stroke. And so what that does is it makes this engine design inherently run cleaner than other designs and be more fuel efficient than other engine designs. And that's why it's the most common engine design still uh, today, okay? So four stroke cycle engine, pretty cool setup. That's what pretty much everybody is gonna have in their car um, or light duty truck. And when you look at other engine designs, you know, a lot of them are all built on this. Like maybe, maybe you go and you say, oh, well, you know what? I, you know, I have a diesel engine. Well, guess what? A diesel engine is almost the same darn thing, okay? Now we got some different stuff on here and there's no spark plugs on a diesel engine and this one even is turbocharged, but you know, it's still going through intake, compression, power and exhaust. The, the basic parts of the cycle are the same. The difference is, is that it's, uh, we, we don't have a throttle valve we're controlling and um, this combustion process is, is happening a little different. We are, we're actually getting that thing to top dead center of compression and that's when we squirt the fuel in there. And so as soon as the fuel is squirted in, it ignites. And this is much more of a combustion cycle that's much more like an explosion than a gasoline four stroke cycle engine is, okay? Um, but the basics of it with two revolutions of the crankshaft, hey, that's, that's all the same. The way the engine block is set up and cylinder head are very, very similar. So anyways, a lot of stuff builds upon this four stroke cycle in that every engine design, it's gonna have some type of intake event because we gotta get the air into the motor, right? And we gotta mix some fuel with that air. Then we gotta squeeze it or compress it. And then we can finally burn it, which is what it's all about, right? But then we have to get the exhaust gases out to do it all over again. So every engine design, whether it's four stroke cycle, a diesel engine like we see right here, even a rotary engine still has to accomplish these same tasks. So I'm gonna go ahead and close out that uh, animation. And um, let's just grab a quick um, uh, video, uh, video clip real quick here. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna play it. This is a cylinder for a four stroke petrol or gasoline engine. But what I'm going to do as I play it is I'm going to turn the CDX guy off so we can just focus on what I want us to focus on here. Now, let's let's get the lay of the land. It's kind of a weird image. What you're looking at is the spark plug right here in the center. I will highlight that. So there's the spark plug. Here's the intake valve I'm going to put in I. Oh, let's see, I'll put it in bright green so it's easy to see. I'll put an I right here. For the intake valve, I'm going to put a E here for the exhaust valve, and you're going to see the intake valve open up as the piston is moving down. You know, the exhaust valve move open on the exhaust stroke. You're going to see those guys happen. So you're looking at the top of the piston, spark plug, intake, and exhaust valves right here. So piston's moving down. It's going on the intake stroke. It's bringing in air fuel mixture. We rely on our fuel delivery system, whether that's fuel injection or a carburetor to make that right mixture. At this point, both valves are closed and we're going up on the compression stroke. As we get really close to the top dead center of the compression stroke, we're gonna fire that spark plug. It ignites the air fuel mixture, makes a lot of heat and pressure and pushes that piston back down. And then the piston's cruising on down. We're getting that power stroke to happen. And right as it's getting to the bottom of its travel, we're gonna start opening up the exhaust valve. The piston comes back up. It pushes the exhaust gases out of there so that we can then close that exhaust valve and do this whole process over again. Now, one thing I may not 
have stressed enough is this weird looking thing here spinning around at the top. That is the camshaft or the cam as we would call it. And the camshaft is responsible for opening up the valves. So it opens up the right intake valve or exhaust valve at the right time and it opens it up by the right amount. But it also is responsible for how quickly I can close those valves. Now, when we look at these valves, we notice, hey, there's a couple big springs on the back of them, right? Well, it's the valve springs that force the valves close, right? But they don't just slam them closed. They let the camshaft control how quickly they can be closed. So the springs are always kind of forcing against the metal of the, of the camshaft. Um, so the camshaft controls the opening of the valves. It controls the rate that the valves are closed. And in order for this to work right, this camshaft, what it's doing has to be perfectly linked down here at the bottom to the crankshaft. So I'm putting crank here, or not C-R-A-N-K. So the cam has to be linked to the crankshaft, right? These guys are timed together. And how it works is that the cam rotates at one half of the crankshaft speed. So if the crank is running at, let's say we're, we're going down the road and we're cruising at 3000 RPM on our gauge on our dash. That means the camshaft's running at one half of that speed or 1,500, 1,500 RPM, okay? So these guys are timed together, but in the four stroke cycle where the crankshaft turns twice, the camshaft only turns once, okay? So camshaft moves at one half crankshaft speed and those two parts have to be perfectly timed together, okay? All right, we'll clear out those drawings. We'll get the video playing again. Okay, so now we're looking at an engine block that's cut away so you can see the pistons moving up and down in their cylinders and the way the connecting rods bolt everything together. The area that's green is where the water would flow through the engine. Those are the water jackets there. We're looking up at the cylinder heads. We can see some edges of some spark plugs. And we're gonna finish off with a great animation of the crankshaft, connecting rod, piston, camshaft, all working in, in unison as we go through intake, compression, power, and exhaust, okay? Intake, compression, power, intake, compression, power, exhaust. In, and we do that over and over and over again. What, um, when I uh, first started teaching high school, my high school students quickly figured out another way to remember this four stroke cycle. They would say, oh, well, Mr. French, that's just suck, squeeze, bang, and blow. That's what's happening in there. Suck, squeeze, bang, blow. So I don't care how you how you remember it, but it's those four events happening inside there. Those four events, those are our cycles, and it's a four-stroke cycle engine, okay? That is the most common engine design there is, bar none. Um, but there are some different alternatives, and so... One of, uh, one of my favorite alternatives would be a two-stroke cycle engine. In a two-stroke gasoline engine, air-fuel mixture enters below the piston into the crank. All right, I'm gonna turn off the CDX guy. So a two-stroke cycle engine is a little different because yeah, just like the CDX guy says here, um, we're going to bring in the air fuel mixture below the piston into the bottom of the engine or the crankcase. Okay. So we're going to bring in the air fuel mixture on the bottom of the engine below the piston. And then when the piston moves down, it's going to force that air fuel mixture from the bottom and it's going to move it to the top through that port on the side called the transfer port. And, uh, one thing you'll notice about this design is that it doesn't have any camshaft. It doesn't have any valves or anything like that. It's a much simpler design, okay? And what I get out of this engine is for every one revolution of the crankshaft, I get a power stroke. So 
what I what I like to do with this engine is I like to say its strokes are a little different. I like to pair its strokes together. And I'll say, okay, what we have here is we do an intake. We're gonna do intake and compression together. And then we're gonna do power and an exhaust together. And we're also going to do something called transfer. Okay, so let's check that out. Intake compression, power, exhaust, and a transfer. So how's that going to work? Well, we're going to start this cycle. The piston starts moving up from bottom dead center to top dead center. And when he does that, he draws in air fuel mixture on the bottom, but at the same time, he's compressing air fuel mixture that already happens to be on the top. So that's how we're doing intake and compression at the same time. We're multitasking. We're drawing air fuel mixture on the bottom and we're taking compressing air fuel mixture on the, on the top. So we do intake and compression together at the same time. What I don't like about that video clip is it kind of cuts us off, right? I don't like how it, it's kind of a little bit glitchy. So what we're going to do, I always end up loading too many of these things, is here we go. And this, you know what I like about this little graphic? There's an engine sitting on my shelf behind me. It's red. It's almost exactly built just like this little animation is. It's a little Comer 50 engine that we used to race when we did uh, uh, little kid goat carts called kid carts. Um, and it's shaped very, very similar. This is a piston port two stroke. So we're going to start with the piston at bottom dead center. Piston starts moving up and he's compressing air fuel mixture on the top. So this part that's getting to a darker blue, I'm compressing it, compressing it, compressing it. But I'm also at the same time doing intake, bringing in air fuel mixture here um, at the top. So intake and compression. It's happening right now. Okay, so. When it gets to the top of its stroke, the uh, spark plug's gonna fire. We're gonna start burning the air fuel mixture. It's gonna make a lot of heat and a lot of pressure and it's gonna force the piston down. As soon as the piston begins to uncover its exhaust port, what's gonna happen is the burnt air fuel mixture is gonna start whistling out of there, going through the little muffler and going out into the air, right? But watch what happens as I continue to advance this thing. At the same time, air fuel mixture now, I'll make it green. Air fuel mixture is doing this transfer operation because there already was air fuel mixture on the bottom. As the piston moves down, it squeezes it. It moves through this transfer port and it gets above the piston. So it does power, exhaust and transfer. And unfortunately what happens is some of that fresher fuel mixture ends up pulling and going right out of the exhaust over here. So two stroke engines, they get the whole job done. They get it done in one. They only need one revolution of the crankshaft to complete their, four, their, their two stroke cycle and to get a power stroke. So every revolution of the crankshaft gets a power stroke but they end up burning more gas and they end up making more smog, okay? And that's why we've seen everything from, you know, not too many cars used them, but cars to, to motorcycles, to dirt bikes, to our garden equipment, move away from two stroke cycle engines and move towards four stroke cycle engines, okay? They just don't run as clean as a four stroke cycle engine, but, for a very simple engine, 
that's lightweight and compact and revs up real high and makes a lot of power for a small size, two strokes reign supreme, right? In that particular application, it's hard to beat a two stroke. So if you're gonna buy like a high output chainsaw, two strokes the way to go because you don't wanna lug around a, a big old engine with a camshaft and all these moving parts and stuff in there. You want an engine that's gonna operate at like weird angles that you might be sawing limbs off of in, and you want an engine that's gonna rev to the moon so that it moves a lot of RPM and can saw through, you know, those big thick tree branches or whatever you're doing. Um, so two stroke engines still definitely have their place. Whereas we've been seeing them slowly phased out over the last 40 years, uh, mostly due to fuel economy and emissions concerns, but they are, are just a neat engine, super fun to, to use and work on and rebuild. I mean, they just, they're, they're just neat engines. They really are. Um, but you're not going to find them in a car. In fact, the only car I can think of that came with a two cycle engine is really old Saabs had two stroke cycle engines on them. Okay. Now we're going to finish up the night um, with one of my favorite engine designs. Okay. And for that, we'll start again with We'll start again with the video clip. The rotary engine is not. And of course the car that you see right here being shown in the clip, that is a Mazda RX-8. And I'll tell you what, out of all the manufacturers that messed around with the rotary engines, Mazda was the only manufacturer that stuck with them for any length of time, okay? It's a fun history lesson. If you look back, General Motors did a lot of research and development on rotary engines. Um, uh, German manufacturers messed around with rotary engines. Um, but at, out of everybody, only Mazda was the one that stuck with them. And they put them in a variety of cars. We had them in all of our RX series. So you had your RX2 your RX-3, there was a four. Um, I think there was even a five. I don't think there was a six. Of course, there was the classic infamous RX-7 sports car that had different various generations from the SA to the FB to the FC. And of course, the one that everybody wants to get is the FD. Those things command quite a high price. It's the last generation of the RX-7. And what you see on the screen right now is the RX-8, which was the last rotary powered car for sale in um, the United States. And so what's different about them is, well, almost everything. This engine design does, gets away from pistons and crankshafts and camshafts and valves and stuff and it uses rotors and it ends up sharing a lot of similarities to two cycle engines. So I'm gonna right over here and I'll say like a two cycle. However, you know what? All engines still have to have different phases. We still have to do an intake. We still have to compress that air fuel mixture we still want to get our power out of it, right? So we're, it's all about some type of power stroke or event. And then we got to get the exhaust gases out to do this cycle all over again. So like the four stroke cycle, we still have to do those events, okay? So um, here's our RX-8 buzzing right along, super sweet motor, fun to drive, sounds, it has its own unique exhaust note. Um, but it does not use pistons and crankshafts like you see right there. It does not have to change a reciprocating or up and down motion to a round and round motion. And inherently what that does is it means that you have less moving parts and you have a smoother running engine. So we have that chrome looking triangular piece there called the rotor. So here we're looking at this rotor running through its cycle. 
and we're following that one part of the rotor around. So it's not having to move up and down. It does move kind of in a weird shape, okay? It's not a perfect circular rotation, but it is a lot more circular than the reciprocating engine. And it makes these engines run very, very smooth. And in fact, what Mazda would do is they'd actually put a buzzer on the dash. So when you revved it past, I don't know, 8,000 RPM or something, uh, the buzzer would come on the dash to let you know, hey, you're revved up right now. Why? Because the engine honestly did not, it didn't feel revved up. It felt like it was just running great. Um, but it still has this piece in the middle called an eccentric shaft. And you can see it's got some gears in there. It's got some side gears as the gear in the rotor meshes with this gear uh, in, the, in the end housing. And because they didn't want to like overwork those gears, overstress them, uh, they didn't really want you revving it, you know, too much past, uh, you know, uh, 7,500 or 8,000 RPM. So they put a buzzer on the dash to let you know, hey, you're revved up now. So what happens is, is that the rotor uncovers a port that leads to the intake. So we uncover that pork, that pork, that port, much like a two-stroke engine. So that's why I said it's like a two-cycle, because we're going to uncover this port right here. And that's going to let air-fuel mixture enter the engine. Then what happens is we cover up that port and we begin to squeeze the air-fuel mixture into a tighter and tighter area. And of course you can tell what we're doing is we are now doing our compression event, aren't we? Now we're going on compression, okay? Of course, as we get to the end of the compression phase of this cycle, we're gonna ignite our spark plugs, but we don't just have a round piston that we have to ignite over. We have this rotor that is shaped long and it's it's triangular and it's weird and it's it's hard to ignite the air fuel mixture with this unique shape. So we don't just use one spark plug, but uh, Mazda's uh, design for this incorporated two spark plugs to help ignite the air fuel mixture and get this stuff burning. Okay, so moving right along, we're gonna fire those spark plugs leading and trailing. And then of course that's blow, starts blowing over our rotor side and it's going on, you guys guessed it, it's going on the power stroke, which is what's gonna force this thing to keep rotating around and around and around. Now, once the air fuel mixture gets all burned up, now we gotta get it out of there, right? And so what you will see happen here is we're gonna uncover an exhaust port and that's gonna let those exhaust gases start flowing out. And then when the rotor half is gonna come around and it's gonna to continue to force those gases out of there, okay? So it still goes through all those different things. It goes through an intake event, a compression event, a, a power event, of course, is what we're after. And it goes through an exhaust event, okay? But there is some stuff happening in here that you might not uh, think about. For instance, um, like how do we keep all this stuff lubricated? Well, we have these seals here at the ends of our rotors. These are called our apex seals. And we have to keep them lubricated. So like a two-stroke, and I don't know if I mentioned this before, but a two-stroke is actually gonna bring in a little bit of oil with the air-fuel mixture. We call it premix. We're gonna mix oil with our fuel to keep stuff lubricated. Well, guess what? A rotary engine needs to lubricate these apex seals. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna inject some oil in the intake to help keep a little bit of oil on those apex seals and keep them lubricated all the time. Okay, so that's one of the things that we do. And then the other thing to think about is this guy goes around um, we've been following, like if we're just looking at one side of this thing over here, what you don't realize is that, hey, the other sides of this are doing their thing as well. So this one rotor with its three sides acts like 
three cylinders, three pistons and three cylinders in a regular piston engine. So a two rotor rotary engine would be, you know, somewhat the equivalent of a, a little inline six or a little V6 engine, if you will. Because each rotor has three sides and they're all doing their thing in, in unison together, right? So as one's going over on compression, another guy's rolling over on exhaust, another guy's going over on intake. And so again, it makes for a very smooth running engine that loves to rev up. But I will pause it right here. One thing rotaries make is a whole lot of exhaust heat because there's not a lot of time in the cycle. Like this cycle happens super fast. And so these exhaust gases are flying out of here at a high rate of speed and they're flying out of here as they're still being burned. And so some of the classics you get from rotary engines is flames coming out the exhaust. And uh, yeah, quite frankly, it looks awesome, okay? But it doesn't run super clean. So like a two-stroke engine, not great for fuel economy, not great for exhaust emissions. And that's ultimately just like what has kind of phased out two-stroke cycle engines over the last 30, 40 years. That is what's phased out rotary engines over the last 30 years as well. If you, you know, if you think about it, uh, the RX-7, the FD phased out for our market in 1995. We brought it back for the RX-8 in the early 2000s. And by the mid 2000s, the RX-8 had, had finished its life cycle. And, uh, you know, it's getting harder and harder to find even an RX-8 that's in, in good condition. Um, these engines, I mean, they, they're, they're fantastic and they can be perplexing all at the same time. And, and they, can be, they can be finicky. Like if you overheat one of these engines um, and it warps the rotor housings or the chrome starts peeling off, like, you know, it's, it's not, you can't just rebore it and hone it. And, you know, it's, um, you, you basically have to either have that housing replated or just get a new housing. And so, um, you know, it's one of those things where in a racing application, it's absolutely fantastic. You don't have to worry about sucking a valve or a timing chain breaking or anything like that. You can rev it to the moon. You can miss a shift. It usually won't damage the motor. Um, and if on a periodic basis, like at the end of every racing season or every other season, you took it apart and you changed those apex seals and, you know, it, these engines last a long, long time. But, you know, that's not how people want to drive their cars. They want to put an engine in a car and drive it for 200,000 miles and this engine design doesn't give you that type of um, life cycle typically. Um, so, you know, if you've got a hundred thousand miles out of one, you're doing pretty good. And, uh, you know, it, it depends on, you know, did you take care of the cooling system? Did you keep the oil level up? A lot of people didn't realize like, even when the engine's running perfect, it's always burning oil. So you got to keep an eye on the oil level of the engine. Also the coolant, you can't see from this graphic, but I'm going to draw it in green. The cooling jackets go around the outside. There's no coolant flowing through the inside of the engine. So we rely a lot on the oil for cooling the internal parts of the rotors. So, um, you know, the quality of the oil was a big deal. The condition of the cooling system is a big deal. And just, you know, these things, it's definitely an enthusiast engine. It's for the person who wants to, you know, enjoy their vehicle and also maintain it and look after it and, and be in tune with it. It's not for somebody that just wants to drive back and forth to work and not pay attention to what they're doing. So um, anyways, great engine, fuel economy and emissions like the two stroke are its Achilles heels. Um, so maintenance wise, what are things that we can do to, you know, um, uh, you know, a, a lot of our, um, our engines to help keep them uh, running well? Well, that would be to change our fluids and our filters and all these engine designs other than the diesel today that we talked about, all utilize spark plugs. So, you know, how do you change the spark plugs? How often are you supposed to change them? You know, if, if we do a better job of igniting the air fuel mixture, 
the engine is going to run a little bit better. It should get a little bit better fuel economy and make a little bit less emissions. So we're going to focus on, you know, um, we don't have a bunch of new assignments for this week. We just want you to take that midterm and that will finish up the stuff we have been talking about. When we come back from spring break, we'll focus on these di different maintenance uh, tasks like changing your spark plugs, your air filter, your fuel filter, and of course your engine oil and how and and uh, coolant and stuff and how important those things are to the to the lifespan of your of your engine. Okay. Um, so you know my tech tip really for this week is just you know making you aware of that stuff. Like you should know as a as a driver. Well, when was the last time was my was my oil changed? When was the last time that we did you know maybe change the coolant? How long have those spark plugs been in there? And um, you, you know, a way that you can kind of maintain a health check of your engine is, and so again, this is related to our, um, related to our tech tip of the night is our, what's our engine's health check going to be? It's going to be the fuel, fuel economy, okay? Now, how can I do that? Well, I just take how many gallons versus how many miles, right? So if I keep, we'll keep this uh, super simple. If I drove, let's say I drove 200 miles and then when I filled up my car, it took me, you know, 10 gallons to fill up my car. All I got to do is divide these two guys together. So 200 uh, or um, 200 divided by 10. Well, 10 goes in there 20 times, right? So I'm getting 20 miles per gallon. Okay. So one thing I would recommend you do to kind of keep an idea of your the health of your engine and to kind of you know identify when something's going wrong is track your mileage like every time you fill up do the math there how many miles did i drive right you can zero out your trip odometer right and and you can see how many miles did i drive how many gallons of gas did i put in there and kind of figure out what your average is maybe your average is 20 maybe it's 25 maybe it's 30 Maybe you're driving a pickup truck and it's only 12. Whatever it is, you know, keep an eye on it. And so if you are normally averaging, let's say, 14.5 miles per gallon, and all of a sudden you notice that, yeah, the, the car seems to be lagging a little bit, and uh, my mileage went from 14 down to 11 miles to the gallon, that's a sign that, hey, something is not right with your car. Now, these days likely is what's going to happen is that you would likely set a check engine light and you can pull codes and kind of get a direction, but you know, not always you could, you could see your mileage drop because maybe you have a brake or something that's dragging and there's no code necessarily for that. So a good way to kind of just keep up on what's the health of my vehicle is by tracking that mileage. When you see the mileage drop off, especially if it drops off, a significant amount, which to me, to me would be a couple miles to the gallon or more. If it drops off that and it does it very quickly, that's a sign that something is different. The only variable that here is how do you drive, right? Because the assumption is you're kind of driving the same type of drive and driving the same route. If you change your driving habit, you know, dramatically, like you normally drove a lot in town and now you start driving on the freeway all the time, well, you're going to naturally get better mileage driving on the freeway, driving at speed, okay? If you normally drive on the freeway and then you switch to only driving around in town and driving short trips, well, that is going to change <clears throat> your fuel economy. It's going to go down. So with this, as you're checking your mileage, if you see it drop, well, you do have to ask yourself, well, did I change my driving habits, okay? If I took my car out to, for a track day, well, obviously my mileage is going to go way down when I'm out on the racetrack. Okay, you know it's it's not uncommon like for a Miata to get 
close to 30 miles to the gallon on the highway. But when that same Miata is out on the racetrack, it's lucky to be getting six miles to the gallon, right? When you're at wide open throttle all the time. So, um, you know, a lot of it depends on your driving habits. If you're doing a lot of around town, you're through the, you're sitting in the drive, uh, drive through at uh, Dutch Brothers or something like you're burning fuel, you're not going anywhere. Well, your mileage is going to drop. But if you're always driving the similar type of driving, similar route, and you see that fuel economy drop out, <clears throat> that's a sign for you that something is wrong and you should investigate it before a little problem becomes a much bigger problem, right? Um, so that is your tech tip for the night. Divide your miles by how many gallons you're putting in and figure out your miles per gallon and keep track of that in a little log book book to keep track of what's going on with your car okay it's also kind of fun because then you can start trying to be more and more um, uh, conservative with your driving and try to get you know, more miles to the gallon which of course should save you a little bit at the pump so um, with that we will uh, wrap things up I hope you guys like we, we never even made it back we never even made it back to uh, the presentation. I'll uh, do a new share. We'll go back over here. We never even made it back to the presentation, but we'll we'll hit it next time as we continue to talk about engines because we'll be talking about engines for a few weeks because uh, you know that's the heart of what make is making most of our vehicles go down the road, right? So there is lots and lots to talk about there. Um, before I leave you guys, and remember, there's no class next week, so I won't see you guys next week. Before I leave you guys, do you guys have any questions on this stuff? Maybe something about engines or something about the midterm that you would like to ask and, uh, you know, want, want me to go over that with you or anything? Any questions out there? I'll go ahead and open up the chat box. I don't see anything there. Okay, well, again shoot me an email, um, you know, get the midterm exam done, um, focus on uh, getting that done and, and getting caught up. If you're behind on anything, try to get those assignments done. Uh, you'll see more stuff posting uh, to, uh, to Canvas uh, throughout our break as I add um, more information to this engine fundamentals that is you know quite sorely lacking at this point um, I'll, I'll be adding more information to you like i said i've made videos on spark plugs uh how to read those and what's going on with the numbers and all kinds of different things that i'll be adding into the class to give you guys as many resources as i can as you move through this at100 course okay everybody well thanks for hanging out with me and listening to a little bit about engines you guys have a, a, a great week away from school. Stay out of trouble. Keep learning. And as I like to say, keep having fun. Okay. All right. Take care, everybody. We'll catch you in a couple weeks. Bye.